Hey, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us this, uh, this afternoon. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, Crystal, thank you for the, the intro. Um, I'm going to try to, as much as possible, uh, keep it uh, short and concise and then open it up to Q&A because uh, in my experience, artist talks are usually best when there can be interaction and it's not just a, not just a monologue. <laughs> so um, get started here. Um, I think the best way maybe to understand uh, the things that I've been up to the last few years is that I'm trying to combine like the historical abstraction or um, uh, abstraction kind of as we know it with a more sort of personal biographical um, take on abstraction, like what makes abstraction mine or what makes it accessible or approachable to me is kind of an important question, right? Because I don't want to just kind of make knockoff abstract expressionist paintings. Um, I want to some way use that history, but also make it personalized and make it mine. So I guess maybe the best way to understand the stuff I make is that it's one part sort of historical abstraction and then one part from culture for my own uh, biography. Um, and I just wanna start by mentioning that I'm 43 years old. And the reason that I say that is because it kind of places me as um, like an early teenager around the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, which is important because a lot of, um, let me see if I can get the, hmm, for some reason, all right. Okay, is this coming through, Crystal? You can see this, yeah, okay. Um, it, it, uh, in that time period, the late 80s and the uh, early 90s, um, you know, a lot of things were happening. There was skateboard culture, there was graffiti culture, there was music culture. And at the time too, uh, things like MTV were really huge. So these are the things that really influenced my uh, sort of entry into the visual world as a, sort of a teenager. Um, and these had a big impact on me. And I think over the last few years too, as I've stopped and thought more about this for these formative years, like this stuff had a giant um, impact on who I am and how I think about the world. Uh, things like garbage pail kids, skateboard graphics, certain toys from the eighties and nineties too. Like, so the palette, the forms, the kind of exuberance, even like the gro grotesqueness of some of this stuff too, um, had a had a big influence on my developing mind. <laughs> and you know, uh, music television really was a huge kind of place to, to, to learn about culture at that time. It's hard to imagine now because it's nowhere near what it was once was. But in the early 90s, it really was kind of a cultural hub. It was like the internet before the internet, sort of, so how you would learn about new bands. And there was a ton of support for animation and for sort of independent cutting edge art to be done too. So things like liquid television, like I mentioned in the previous slide, were sort of these they're really the kind of the only places to get this stuff as a, a teenager growing up kind of in the Midwest before the internet. So this is the stuff that really um, had a big impact on my visual education into the world. Uh, also in that same time period, late eighties, early nineties, um, hip hop music obviously was huge um, for, for me. And so the things that were uh, not only the music itself but also the artwork that was associated with uh, the scene was big too. Here, this Organized Confusion record cover, uh, or this DOS FX album cover too. So the, the color palette, um, the forms, again, kind of like the exuberance of all of this uh, really was seared pretty dramatically into the front frontal lobe of my brain when I was 13 or 14 or 15 years old. And it's taken me, you know, many years to kind of process this stuff to recognize that it was really important, but then also be able to use these touchstones in a way that wasn't just kind of like illustrating them or, you know, um, wasn't kind of just didactic or obvious, but in a way that kind of felt like I was, you know, synthesizing these influences and then reusing them for something else that was uh, combined with other things too. So here, the Tribe Cult Quest. So you could take really any of these record covers or any of the visual and aesthetic things from this time period and um, use it as an example of things that were really influential to me when I was developing. Uh, the other thing at the same kind of time <clears throat> uh, was uh, graffiti art, right? So New York subway graffiti from 75 to 89, sort of like the, the classic first wave of uh, graffiti in New York City. Um, was big and I was obviously too young still at this time to experience this firsthand or to even know about it until the kind of the second wave 
uh, sort of swept through the country in uh, the early 90s, which was kind of when I caught, caught it. Um, but this stuff, I mean, still, when I go back and look at it, it still looks as fresh to me as the day it was made. <laughs> Um, and the early stuff too is, is really a big, big, big influence. Um, at the time it wasn't as, as huge, but now as kind of time goes by, it, I'm able to go back and really appreciate um, how big this was. So this book, Subway Art, was one of the ways that that first wave of New York subway graffiti got kind of transmitted to the rest of the country. <clears throat> um, it's really sort of a, a lot of people reference this as being an important transmitter of that. Uh, and also DJ culture. So I was, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, watching MTV, trying to just desperately attain culture in any way that I could from uh, a pre-internet Midwestern position. Um, and DJ culture instantly kind of seduced me as well. I thought it was amazing that people could take two copies of a pre-existing record and just, just through the, the process, just recontextualize it and turn it into something brand new. So again, like taking pre-existing material, altering it, and then having something that was almost totally different, but you could still kind of get the echoes and the hints of its original form really was, really was exciting to me. So that um, not only DJing literally, but also just the conceptual mo model of DJing, like taking pre-existing things, cutting it up, rearranging it, making it into something new was, was and still is a really big um, foundational aspect of what, what I do and really how I think about painting. So that had a giant um, influence on me. Um, these are sort of, um, now that's the cultural stuff from the late 80s and the early 90s, the things that really kind of were one part of the soup that I want to describe today, right? Um, the other part of the, the, of the soup is the stuff from, you know, you know, fine art or art history proper. And so people like Elizabeth Murray are really big. Um, and influential. I love, and again, the exuberance of the forms, the sort of the energy and the excitement and the just the, the joyfulness of Elizabeth Murray is something that I always uh, really admired and gravitated towards. Frank Stella uh, is another really big influence on me. Um, and also he's a person that I could just listen to lectures for hours and hours because of how um, entertaining he is to hear speak about the work too. In almost all eras, I would say too, of Frank Stella. You know, this is some of his work from I think this is probably from the 80s or 90s, uh, but even his more austere, like early modernist works, like the black stripe paintings are really exciting to me too. I could follow him through almost any era. Uh, Franz Klein, obviously as well, sort of the scale of this abstraction and the idea too of taking um, a mark or a human brushstroke or a mark and sizing it up, expanding it. And so what happens when you start to play around with scale uh, Franz Klein was really instructive in this way and kind of shows a path forward. Um, what happens if you just change something as simple as the size of something? Uh, Picasso obviously is always there on my mind, uh, especially this, this, this painting that not a lot of people talk about, but Night Fishing in Antibes uh, is really beautiful to me because it's not only, you know, it's the modernist chopping up a form, but also the color palette where it feels like the colors that he's using are so evocative of like a flashlight illuminating the Mediterranean ocean at night um, that it just gets me every time. And so there's a lot of work you know, later on in this, in this um, slideshow that you're gonna see where I'm really, you can see this, the influence of this particular painting <clears throat> really at work in, in some of the stuff that I've made recently. Uh, Francis Picabia too is another person <clears throat> from the modernist canon that I really admire and always go back to time and time again. Just because of the, in him, it's a sort of the play between the illusionism of the form, like the dimensionality versus the flatness, uh, and also just how striking and again like exuberant his uh, his compositions are. Michelin Thomas, um, a contemporary living artist that I take a lot of inspiration from, and then she is amazing. <clears throat> um, Albert Olin, a German artist, um, who was one of the first people in the sort of the early '90s to start using uh, digital technology in. Uh, painting. So he is a person that I often look at and take inspiration from as well. Um, obviously you can't talk about my work without 
talking about the elephant in the room, which is Roy Lichtenstein, right? <laughs> so the idea of taking something like a brushstroke, which we often assume is very personal and autobiographical and turning it into a symbol or an object um, is something that I always really, like when I, even when I first saw Lichtenstein, I was like, wow, that's a really smart move because it makes you see in question um, kind of the authenticity of, of mark making or the authenticity of like an abstract expressionist idea. Um, and it kind of really makes you um, face that. Like, is this real? Is this not? Is this, is this a reproduction? So there's also like real unreal types of questions that pop up in Lichtenstein that I think are really great. So those are kind of the, um, the two major worlds of influence that I'm working with and trying to sort out through my work, the cultural and sort of autobiographical stuff, and then the sort of art historical precedents from, from history. And I'm trying to, um, again, like combine them and recontextualize them into something that makes sense for me and something that matters. So this is just a, a photograph of, uh, I have a, I'm in my studio now behind me, but in my living space, which is just across the hall, I also have like a collage station. So I have all these drawers of different types of marks. So it's almost becomes like a taxonomy of <laughs> types of marks. Um, and what I do is I start by making brush strokes on pieces of paper that are, that are different types of brush strokes. So some of them are more graphic, some of them are more expressive, some of them are um, more digital. So I take those and then I take them to the copy, the, the digicopy, and I make Xerox photocopies of them, which is I, sometimes I blow them up, I alter them, I move them around on the photocopy bed so that there's some sort of distortion that happens in a lot of them as well. So I can create forms that way. Then I cut them out and then I put them in these drawers so that I have them kind of just as ready-made um, collage objects. And then uh, what I do is I use them, <clears throat> you know, I paint basically with these sort of ready-made um, collage objects and to create compositions, which you're seeing in the background. And here's a, um, uh, an example of what they start to look like after I'm able to kind of use um, these, you know, pre-existing brushstrokes to make compositions, right? And so the one thing I like is that the, the, the things that I love about abstract expression is how dynamic it is, how energetic it is. But um, I'm also skeptical of kind of like the authenticity of that or like to have the performative aspect of abstract expressionism. So in some ways this allows me to kind of get around that. I can ha have a, a brushstroke that is uh, obviously artificial, right? Or constructed, but I can also get the kind of the dynamic visual aspects that I love from abstract expressionism. So it's kind of like my way of getting my cake and eating it too, right? <laughs> Uh, but this is what the first step is. So uh, it's kind of, it's mediated along the way, right? So um, I, this is me making these brush strokes with like black paint or ink on paper, then photocopying them, then cutting them out, then arranging them back into a composition, then photographing the compositions. <laughs> and then that becomes the starting point for the paintings. And so these are some early paintings that were made uh, right when I first started with this, with, with this process around 2015. Um, and this is just, these are just kind of baby steps trying to figure out how to um, work with the information from those collages and how to get them to be still like living, breathing, viable things. Cause I didn't just want to copy the photo, the, the collages, right? That, to me, it would seem kind of pointless. So I wanted them to have a life of their own for me to you be able to use that information, but to create something exciting and thrilling in its own right. So these are kind of these early attempts <clears throat> at um, figuring that stuff out. And uh, this this lecture is starting in about 2015. Uh, there's a, obviously a lot more work. If you wanted to go to the website, which Crystal will probably talk about at the end, uh, there's a, there's, a, there's archives that go back to about 2007. So if you're wondering what I made before this stuff, that's there um, in the archives. Um, so, you know, these were some of the first paintings that I made um, trying to work out the collage approach. Um, and, you know, what I liked about them is they had, they retained that sort of artificial construction that points back to kind of like the DJing influence that I'm just taking pre-existing things, putting them together. Um, but they are made out of paint. So there is this like, weird 
um, question that happens, especially if you get to see these in person and we're not quite sure what you're looking at. Is this real? Is this unreal? Um, and I like, that's kind of like the delicious part of it for me is that, <laughs> that it makes the viewer question what they're looking at, right? Rather than just like a pretty, a pretty thing. Um, and I also, in these first ones, wanted to start, you can kind of see in, um, in the upper left, I'm trying to, I'm kind of mimicking the effects of the photocopy. And that was something that I had to kind of learn how to do because I didn't know how I was going to do that at first. So this type of painting required me to kind of relearn how I was going to do things um, and how I was going to actually make these things look uh, like their, their source material. Um, and as I did more of them, I kind of started to get a little bit better about figuring that stuff out. Um, you know, and as the more that you photocopy something, the, the more that it starts to degrade or break down. So the image quality also starts to kind of degrade. And I liked that aspect of it. Metaphorically, I think also in the work, like as abstraction continues to be, be practiced and handed down from generation to generation, it changes with each, it's almost like a game of telephone. The original message gets definitely altered by the time that you the last person utters the sentence, right? So I kind of think about abstraction and painting in that way. So this is an installation shot. So this was a show in 2016, um, uh, I think, at UW Parkside. So you can just kind of see what these look like when they're installed in a gallery space. And this also goes back to that Franz Klein thing that, that I was talking about, where you know if you uh, uh, a, a, a photocopy or a Xerox collage, you imagine it to be pretty handheld size, right? Kind of desktop size. And I think that once um, they got larger, they started to get stranger because you weren't used to seeing um, you know a photocopy that was as big as your body um, or even larger than that. So the scale aspect that's something that I learned from just looking at a lot of Franz Klein work. Um, definitely have to plays into this stuff. And this is another installation shot of a similar work. And again, this is around two, late 2015, early 2016. <clears throat> and if you get a chance and in the future or something to look at these in, in, in person, um, they have a lot of different, uh, each shape is treated as its own thing. I'll show you some, some close-ups in, in a minute here, but um, they're, they're, the, the paintings themselves, and it, this becomes increasingly important as the work goes on, mirrors the collage, not only in, in terms of its imagery, but also in terms of its materiality. Um, so this is, again, this is about 2017. So I started to play around with different forms of, of composition. This one obviously is much more kind of tightly structured. Uh, um, and it's much more about like fitting into and working with the rectangle rather than kind of exploding out into or around. Um, and I worked for about four years exclusively just in black and white, because I felt like not only was there a relationship to the, the original black and white Xerox copy that I liked, but there was also enough problems, you know, materially, how I was gonna make this stuff that it kept me really busy <laughs> and really challenged for a long period of time. What you're going to see like in an image like this is a lot of the marks are also using printmaking techniques where I'll create a particular type of surface and then I'll paint the mark on a, on a, on a separate surface and then transfer that to the painting. So a lot of these have printmaking um, approaches involved in them too. So, but I would say that, you know, within each individual work, I'm trying, each mark is kind of made differently. So it's not just one technique or one kind of formula that's being used. It's a variety, which again, that kind of um, heterogeneity is something that I really like about, about the approach. I want it to be, feel like a collage. There's a lot of difference happening. Um, this is just another installation shot. So this is from the 2017 show at the Alice Wilds in Milwaukee. So again, you can kind of get a, get a sense of what these look like when they're uh, installed in a in a, in a space. And it's hard when you're looking at images like JPEGs on a computer screen to imagine what they, what the objects really are. So I just included a couple of these installation images just to kind of see what they look like in the wild. <laughs> um, and in, uh, in 2000, this is my dog, Miles. Um, in 2017, in late summer, I was invited to do, which at the time was the big, and still is, the biggest painting that I've ever completed. It was 22 feet. 
yeah, 22 feet by seven feet. So this, this uh, painting is actually, and you can see in this image, there's two panels on the right and left side. Uh, it was originally conceived of as a single long painting, uh, but needed to be in two parts because it's permanently installed at the Thelma Sadoff Center, which is in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. So you can go there and you can look at this, but it's in kind of two sections in their lobby. So it was too big to fit. But when it was originally shown, it was shown as a single. Um, and that was the first image that I showed uh, in the beginning of the, of the, the slide lecture. But I made it all on site. So this is a, an abandoned old storefront in Fond du Lac downtown that they gave me the, the space to work in for about two weeks. And I basically kind of lived there <laughs> in this dusty old storefront for about two, two full weeks with my dog and um, made this painting. Also inventing your own tools is really important. <laughs> so because that painting was so large, I had to figure out a way to get giant brush strokes and, and uh, large scale things. So mm -hmm. I uh, combining um, thinking on the fly and making your own tools was really important. So this was later on, this is like one half of it. You can see the scale of my dog here. Um, and this is what it looks like when it was finished and installed as a single, um, a single uh, painting. So you can see that the person standing next to it, you can kind of get a bodily scale sense of what this thing looks like. So again, you, you, this thing, even though it's broken up into two parts, it's still uh, publicly visible in Fond du Lac. Uh, and then, then there was a big switch at, at about the end of 2017 to color. Color was something that I always knew was gonna creep back into the work because obviously I love color. I think it's a great challenge. It's really exciting. Um, but I was kind of patient with myself and waited until I felt like it was the appropriate time. Now, when you look at so the, the, uh, the colored work now, which dates from about late 2017 up till now, um, you're gonna start to see some of that early 90s cultural influence. So the palette, I'm really interested in, in taking color combinations that are kind of sour or kind of difficult. So you get these, these oranges next to these purples next to these uh, sort of violets and fuchsias that are really kind of purposely a little bit like angular and kind of off-putting. Um, and those are really kind of that reference to the, how important the, the just the, the cultural milieu of like the early nineties, late eighties were in, in these. So in a painting like this, you can also see that I'm also amping up the materiality. So you, in this, these middle sections, some of the paint gets really, really thick now. So a lot of those black and white paintings were pretty lean in terms of their materiality. There wasn't a ton of like, you know, gloppy paint thrown on them. They were really pretty, pretty thin paintings because uh, they kind of needed to be. But one of the things also, as soon as I started using color, I kind of started to open up the possibilities of much more materiality. So some passages in this painting are really high gloss and really slick. Others are really matte and really chunky and really thick. Um, and you'll see that in some of these other slides too. So this is another painting that's late 2017. Um, this one was at Art Basel um, with the Geisberg Gallery in 2018 as well. Uh, but this also, I think you can see in this one, not only does it have that same kind of color palette, almost a comic book kind of like uh, feel to it, but it also expresses, I think, that influence of, of graffiti art, right? Like early subway art. And so these are some more work from uh, probably late 18, early 19. And um, again, I'm kind of experimenting with the materiality of this stuff, but I'm also, um, you know, again, trying to, to really amp up the differences between the passages. So no two shapes really are treated the same way or painted in the same way. So I wanted there really to be a vast difference between how each thing was being painted. And continuing to push this, like, and call it semi-gaudy color combinations or I'll use the word unexpected. How about that? <laughs> Sounds better. Unexpected color combinations. <clears throat> and so here's an installation shot of the solo show in New York in early 2019 at Asia Geisberg Gallery. Um, so there's a couple of the paintings I just showed in, in slides. So again, so you can kind of get the scale. These aren't giant paintings, but they're uh, you know, larger than maybe expected. Uh, and this, these are some more recent ones. These, these, these uh, were images that were painted this year. Uh, one of the, the windfalls of COVID is that I've had a lot of time. Uh, so I've gotten a lot of work. I've done like, like four shows worth of painting in one year. It's amazing. Um, but again, like you can see the kind of the, the Picasso night fishing in Antibes, I think, 
you can start to see that influence in this. There, I wanted to, to create color spaces that were evocative of so like nighttime or sort of like the city at night or even like an aquarium kind of idea. So some of these have those illusions uh, to them too in, their, in terms of their color palette. Um, same thing here. It's almost like bioluminescent type of color that's happening. And again, I think you can see in this image, there's a, a like each passage or each shape that's in this painting is, is treated just totally differently from the next. So it's not only a, an image of a collage, but it's also like literally a collage materially because each thing is just a totally different material. Um, and here's this one from the summertime. So then I started to pull away from the kind of all, the all encompassing color environments. And I wanted it to be much more referential of the kind of like a white background sort of like the original collages. So it almost looked like they were on paper. But if you get a chance to see these in person anytime, the, the white is like a super, super, it takes me forever to do these. They're really, really eggshell surface um, where I'm using layers and layers of medium to get almost like a, it looks like an ice skating pond basically. By the time I'm done, there's like no surface incident and they're like super, super, um, super, super slick. Um, but here's some close up images. You can kind of see how different the materiality is. Um, so like the orange and reddish shape is really chunky, really thick. And then some areas are really thin and just stained almost. So that like really wide variety of, it's also like a celebration of painting, right? So I'm trying to just be like, I just want everything. I want the, the really thin stained stuff. I want the really goopy, uh, luscious, like, gooey gooey paint too, all in the same uh, painting and see if I can get them to coexist. So this image, you can kind of see how things are pooling or staining or very liquidy versus other things that are much, uh, much more, um, again, like goopy. And, you know, playing around with how I can do things, stretching the extreme differences between the passages is something I'm always interested in pushing forward for. So this is another one from this summer, and this is a relatively big painting uh, as well. But this is, I'm gonna show you some, um, uh, some close-ups of this. So you can kind of get the material difference is really apparent. So this sort of brown mark is being you know, made you know, through optical mixing through all of like a, a, just a proliferation of color, right? So this goes back also, it's kind of like to impressionism or to um, you know, that sort of late 18th century type of painting but also with stuff that references almost, you know, digital stuff like this, the bottom right hand mark has a sort of a, um, like a TikTok filter effect. And so, you know, again, combining these languages from different places this is always exciting to me. And you can cut, there's my dog again, he's made a, an appearance in a lot of these. Right? Uh, but you can see, uh, again, the, the size of these, and these are all um, on raw canvas. So the, some of the staining and the raw canvas stuff, uh, Again, I want it to be like, you know, a reference to the starting point, like the, so you can kind of, it's almost like you're watching the painting build itself. Um, I want that to be like how it's made to be really available uh, in the image itself. Uh, and this is the last slides. This is again, it was from the same, the same uh, time period this last summer, um, which was really kind of like a wonder, wonderful world. Cause I had gotten momentum from the spring and then I kind of had all this time to just make this work. So. Again, like this is, you know, try, again, combining the different approaches in the different languages, the pseudo digital and the staining and the historical stuff. So just trying to combine all these ingredients to make a, a tasty soup and to make abstraction that feels like it's mine. That it's not only has something to do with the trajectory and the canon of art history, but also something that feels very personal at the same time. So that's really the point. So 1246. <laughs> I finished with one with one minute to spend, one minute over. Okay. Um, so I think that uh, the best thing to do is just to open it up to Q and A. If anybody has any comments or questions or anything at all. Any questions from anyone? I have a question. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay. Um, Shane, it's Virginia and Tom Maher. We we uh, have one of your paintings that we got oh, the yeah. Hardy. Yes. Okay. You haven't seen it hanging here, but um, are your color you, are your color paintings just paintings, or are they 
are all the forms collaged on there that you've cut out like you did in the black and white ones? Um, the paintings themselves all paint. It's all paint. It's all paint. Yep. There's not in all the paintings. It's uh, it, it it's all 100% paint. So paint being used just in different ways. Yeah. And, and I'm purposely trying to mimic obviously the look of collage. So I like that there's that you're uncertain whether or not it's an actual collage or if it's paint. So that's part of like the illusionistic aspect of it, for sure. Okay. So yeah. it's the look of collage. The look of collage, but everything is 100% paint. Yeah. And I, okay. and I, and I, there's a lot of additives too. There's, you know, a lot of different mediums. There's a ton of different, even in this painting that's on the screen now, there's a ton of different thickness differences too. And things that have been right. done okay. and the paint has been altered in a lot of ways to, to create that kind of difference. But and what size are those paintings? Uh, this one right here is uh, 27 by 37. Um, these here are uh, the one on the left is like 47 by 57. And then the larger ones near closer to my dog are uh, like 70, uh, 76 by 56 or something like that. Okay. I, I have three, Tom Maher, I have three uh, short questions. Uh, in, in your initial influences, you didn't mention Warhol and not so much for subject matter, but are you influenced him, uh, by him by coloration? First question. Second question, uh, it, it, I, I want to believe that there's impasto or thickness to this. Are you using a palette knife in any way, shape or form? And lastly, the piece we own uh, appears to have corrugated cardboard strips. And I, I seriously doubt if they're hand painted, they're exact. They're precise, they're equally spaced, the texture, blah, blah, blah. So Warhol, impasto, and corrugated uh, cardboard simulation. Great questions. Uh, yeah, Warhol is a giant influence in me. I, you know, I, I, if I, had, I wish I had three hours to, to list everybody that, um, but I think that also his, his um, just the way he treats the idea of like printmaking and reproduction is huge, right? Uh, and his coloration is so brash and I love it. It's, so, it's like audacious. When I think about like, you know, when you see some of those, um, I mean, anything really from, from his mature period, it's just like, it's just like, wow, you just did that. And I think that audacity is something that's really influencing um, to me as well, for sure. Um, and then also just the idea of, of like a, a reproduced printmaking idea in, in the painting. I mean, I think it was a huge, a huge like, philosophical break in the sixties when he, when he introduced that idea. And I think that's still really important today. Uh, the impasto parts, um, they are, there are parts that are really, really, really thick, almost to the point of being kind of ridiculous. Um, and those, uh, in some cases I'm using palette knife. I'm using palette knife in a lot of ways to get like, to treat the, the shapes first so that they almost become again, like a kind of a skating rink kind of smooth surface upon which to paint. But a lot of it is just, um, uh, just really thick brush work in it too. Again, where I'm kind of making my own homemade brushes to be big enough to, to do some of this stuff too. Um, and then the third question was that I do use stencils and the piece that you have uh, has stencils. So the, the even lines um, are part of stencil work, which relates again to Warhol, the idea of using stencils or using printed, but there's no commercial printing stuff in any of the work that I ever do. It's really important to me that they all be handmade for some reason to kind of make that built in contradiction of the regular mechanical versus the still very traditional handmade parts of the paintings. Does that kind of answer Thank the you. question? Yes. Okay, great. Anybody else have any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the influence of graffiti, mm -hmm. um, not just through mark making, but I'm curious if there's been um, more of like that cultural influence, like the subculture painting on surfaces that aren't supposed to have paint on them. And I'm curious if that's kind of carried through it all through your process. Yeah, without getting too detailed into it, when I was a teenager, I was, <laughs> I was actually involved in that world. So um, a lot of, just the way that I think was was um, was influenced by that, and I'm a person that again I don't want to get into the weeds too much about this stuff, but uh, I'm really skeptical of street art, but I love graffiti because of that unexpectedness that you don't expect to see it where you see it, and there is that obviously the deviance aspect to it too. That obviously when I was 
15 was really important to me. So I, oftentimes I do get questions about whether or not people think I'm co-opting a culture that, I, that isn't mine or I didn't belong to. I don't know if that's where, you, where your question's coming from, but um, it, I definitely, <laughs> but again, without getting too much into detail, I was a participant in that subculture for many years. And so that's where that influence comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also just like the exuberance of it, um, it, it also just kind of relates to a zeitgeist of a sort of that time period as well. Maybe I'm dodging your question, but is that kind of? Well, I just was more curious about like, because the subculture of graffiti making is like uh, art in unexpected places and on unexpected surfaces. And so I was curious if like trying to create unexpected surfaces has carried through or sort of that like naughtiness, not supposed to be doing things this way. Yeah, I, mean, I love that, right? <laughs> I think that artistic deviance in that, re in that regard is always wonderful. Oh, wow. um, yeah, like you shouldn't do this or you're breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. I think that is 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 important for sure. I mean, a lot of the work that I like does that all the time for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I would I would certainly wouldn't say that the work is is like transgressive, like because I don't think it's that radical. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But and it, yeah, it's it's it does get into sticky subject because it's a, it's a, obviously graffiti is a real subculture and there's a lot of different feelings either way about about whether or not it should should be. Um, I mean, I think my, my skepticism about street art is that it takes the style without any of the substance. So it becomes like the difference between seeing a lion in a in a savanna versus seeing a lion in a zoo. It's a very different experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like one can kill you and the other one can't. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I mean, this is a complicated topic too. <laughs> I have one other question. Um, yeah considered presenting your initial collages alongside with the paintings and shows or do you want to maintain that element of mystery of your process yeah great question and I, that's when i get some, some somewhat regularly yeah I, I would never show the collages mm. it's actually it's weird that i actually sh i showed them today i usually don't in slide presentations mm. um because i do yeah i do like the magician's mystery like you don't know how it's made <laughs> um mm. yeah i think sometimes people can be too uh, forthcoming and it actually kind of it, do you love the magic trick more or less when you know how it was done you know mm -hmm. so I, I don't know I guess that's an open question to, to, to you all too it's like does it help to see the collages or would you rather not see them I like seeing them you do you like seeing the process? Me too. Yeah. yeah I like seeing them I, I, also I enjoy the process yeah. exists but yeah. I don't know that I need to see the end route. I don't know that I need to see the collage at the beginning. I like knowing that the process exists and like understanding the process, but I don't know if I need to see the collage. Yeah. And that's kind of the way I feel too. So I'm kind of I'm guarded about the, not that it's like a proprietary thing. It's, I mean, it's an easy idea. Anyone can come up with it. Right. But the question is like, uh, do you, does it help you to appreciate the end result more or does it actually detract from it or just sort of, yeah. I guess that's the question that I was wrestling with. It's never occurred to me to show the, the collages um, because to me, they're very separate. It's just a means to the end, right? Yeah. For me, at least. You could also bring that up a little bit too. What's that? I would rather not, not see them because like, uh, like Picasso said, a poor artist copies a great artist steals. <laughs> uh, so I'd rather not see them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, in terms of just describing the process, they're useful to show like in a context like this, but I don't think in a gallery situation that I would mm -hmm. um, show them. Even though it's like, you know, there's incentives, to, they're, they're smaller, they're more portable. People would probably want to have some, have some of them, but, uh, and also they're just not archival. Like they're just a crappy paper with uh, bad Xeroxes cutouts. So they would probably disintegrate within like, two months after after someone got one. So I would feel too guilty about something falling apart if someone else did it. Um, well, I had a couple of questions, although we're still open to others, but um, I was wondering you, and I had to step away a bit, during the, when you were showing some of the artists that you were looking at now, so I may have missed it. Um, but I know you were, you were looking at expressionists and graffiti art and different contemporary artists and all sorts of abstract. But what you 
too, it's almost like photorealism of, uh, you know, of abstract. Uh, so do you uh, look to any of the like Trumpo artists or photorealists to look for techniques? That's a, first of all, it's a really great thing to notice and to point out in the work is the fact that it actually is ultra representational work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, again, like that usually gets, you know, in a conversation that usually takes a while to, to get to that point, but you're absolutely right. I mean, in some ways, these are like the most realistic, you know, representational paintings there could be. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So yeah, and this, the trompe l'oeil thing too is something that, you know, in the earlier slides that I showed you, I'll go back to some of this stuff. Um, some of them have like drop shadows or hints at illusionistic, yeah. especially in this one, right? And that was something that I had kind of been playing around with early on. And then I got really kind of, it felt almost like gimmicky to me. So I kind of stopped mm -hmm. that. Um, but I, I mean, it's still a really useful device because it creates a sense of light then on in the, in the piece. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, the, so a lot of the trompe l'oeil stuff is, it's, it's very seductive and it's always there kind of like beckoning me, <laughs> you know, like a siren to hit the rocks. But that's, an, that's another thing I think I'm, I mean, at, at some point it could come back and I could use it more than it does. But there, I, one of the things, I was just doing this commission last week and it was black and white, which I hadn't been working in for a while, but I had kind of come back to the realization that there is something just in the overlap of the form that creates the illusion that I don't need to be extra like extra about it, right? Like the process itself kind of sets up in a nice way without me trying, having to be like illustrative about it. So I've kind of learned to pull back and let the, let the things be, let them kind of the magic that's already there and take care of itself. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and then I had a question from the comments uh, that, your work was uh, featured in Who Live Sports Ed last year. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and can you share how that came to be? Uh, so this is the one that is actually in the, 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 the television ad. Um, I, uh, I work with a consultant uh, that does TV and, and, and movie stuff too. So sometimes I get them contacting me that they, if they need like paintings to be in television shows or commercials or stuff like that. But this one happened before I started working with it. I just knew I just knew this guy locally that was a runner for like for television production, and they were doing the Hulu ad with Giannis and Tintacupo, the Bucks player. So they were filming it locally, and he needed he needed it was the premise of the of the ad was that it's going to be in his agent's office. So they needed work that they thought a sports agent would have in their <laughs> office. So they just they contacted me and they said, "What do you, uh, we need a, a painting for this?" this thing and of course for like for you know I'm a basketball fan so I was like oh that's a great idea so they took it and sometimes when these things happen it's like you're it's like the painting could be like in the back you know like it is like way in back and they just like just briefly will flash for a second it's not a glamorous thing and you don't really see it but in this case it's like really really in in the ad if you google Hulu Giannis Bucks you can see the, the advertisement, but that just happened just because of somebody I knew and it was a, a serendipitous kind of windfall that happened, um, but it was cool. And the, or the orientation of this painting has actually shifted, which is the, sec was the kind of the embarrassing secret about this is that this is the way this painting is supposed to appear and in, in the ad it's sideways. <laughs> but what are you gonna do? <laughs> So yeah, they, I mean, the, and it was cool because they played. They, you know, it was a national television ad. They played during the playoffs too, and when, when the Bucks were. Um, so it's it's interesting because I, I don't I don't make work that really fits into a commercial context, right? But it's interesting when when it kind of does make that transition. Because mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I don't make the paintings being like, I hope this is in a Hulu ad for you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I don't make work that tries to appeal to that either, but it's always a, kind of an interesting and cool thing when that stuff happens. Though. All right, does anyone else have any uh, other questions? I have a question about the brushes. I saw that you taped them all together. Yeah. Like, do you have to do that often or have you ever tried getting like custom made brushes? 
Because I, I know in Japan, they usually do some really, really big ones too. Yeah, and I've seen also people um, take a fancier approach and have sort of like a metal plate and they screw into. Mm -hmm. um, the, and the, the image that I showed you, that was just, I had to just figure it out on the fly because I wasn't in my home studio. So in that case, it was just the, the chip brushes from the hardware store and duct tape was gonna do the job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that one, I mean, I should. Did I should get, get nicer materials, but this worked for what I needed it to do. Um, and I don't often, it like hold up. Did it hold up for the period of time that you were painting or did yeah, the did tape for, start to fall apart? For when I needed it, it worked perfectly. And it was basically just like a one, I just needed it for one mark. Oh. <laughs> so this was like, it did what it needed to do. Um, and I, I, I don't, cause this again was the, for that giant painting. So I don't often need brushes that are this obnoxious, but um, it does have a dramatic effect though, doesn't it? Yeah, cool. cool. It's like the, the Michael Jackson um, performers on the boardwalk that have all the 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 dancers that are the puppets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I look great. I was just like, wow, I like that. Because <laughs> I was wondering if you did the marks with smaller brushes, but then seeing that, I was just like, okay, so you've actually created like your own gigantic brush to do that one stroke. Yeah, and you know, with each painting, it's different too because. Um, some, some of them I'm doing with actual brushes and making the mark. And then in some cases I use, one of the, the secret materials I use a lot of is liquid latex. Mm -hmm. So liquid latex is basically like liquid frisket, which is a masking medium where I can get organic, organic shapes and organic forms okay. and mask, to get masks. So yeah, some of them are so, um, some of the marks are so particular that I could just never recreate those, um, in a, with an act, you know, like an actual stroke. So I have to figure out how am I going to reproduce that on a scale that's like giant without having to make a brush that's as big as a room, you know. Mm 